Welcome to Great Gardens. It's the middle of winter and I'm thinking about spring. I don't know about you. Today we're going to talk to Melissa and Neil about starting your seeds indoors. That's one of the first signs of spring. And we're going to learn all about how to do that successfully. So come along and let's talk to them. Hello, Neil and Melissa. How are you guys today? How are you doing? Hey, Peter. We're here uh, with Melissa and Neil from Western Nurseries, and we're going to talk today about seed starting. And we're standing in front of a whole bunch of seed packets. This kind of excites me. I, th I think of spring now, and I'm getting excited. There's two feet of snow on the ground, maybe three. And uh, a lot of people will start thinking about starting seeds indoors, but there's a lot of people who don't do that. And there's a lot of economical advantages, I would imagine, of, start of starting your seeds indoors. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think it's exciting and it's also cost effective to um, to start your seeds. You just need to make sure that you don't start your seeds too early. A lot of people get excited right now and just seed everything at once. Right. And you really need to select what needs to be started now, what needs to be started in two weeks, do your research. Um, We're in mid-February right now. Right. And uh, when is in Massachusetts probably a good time to start some of the earlier well, Neil's got it down. Uh, it's it, I think it, you really have to sit down and do a planning session and draw it out and see how big your garden is going to be or if you're going to expand your garden and, mm -hmm. and so forth. I think from there, I think you would definitely want to start your things that take longer, and which would be peppers and tomatoes. I think peppers could start in the middle of uh, February to the 1st of March. And okay. parsley. Parsley and takes parsley. a long time. And, but those are the first things you'd want to start off with, would be uh, just to get those started and, and trays and stuff like that uh, before anything else is started. Okay, so peppers. Where do, we, do we have some peppers here? We have some right over here. There's some peppers right there. Okay. That, uh, so this is uh, actually, this isn't really that's a actually, consumer. Yeah, uh, yeah, this is something that we have bought in um, as Western Nurseries is growing, so we bought this on a commercial level. Okay. The cool thing about buying seeds at the store and not online is that all the information is on the packet, and it will tell you days to maturity. It will tell you days to germinate, which is really key. You've got... Um, bush beans here, eight days to germinate. You obviously don't want to start those quite yet. We've started some because we're doing a project um, for the flower show, but otherwise you wouldn't be starting beans until beans the last would second. Beans would be sold, probably the earliest would be the middle of uh, April. Okay. That's a weather permit. Neil, you're an avid home gardener. You've, I've been to your place before, a huge vegetable garden. What are, what are the crops you grow out there? I grow peppers, uh, tomatoes, cucumbers, all different kinds, kinds of squashes, uh, lettuce, onions, pretty much everything, pumpkins, pretty much everything you see on the table here. And are you starting everything from seed yourself? Yep. yep. Everything from seed? Everything from seed. Huge uh, uh, cost savings when you do that in terms of buying over the finished Oh, plant. definitely. Especially definitely, with yeah. peppers and tomatoes, yeah, you really get your money's worth. Definitely, and uh, as long as you just have it, I think a planning uh, process would be the most important. Like you can't throw all your seeds all at one. one right, we're gonna talk about you know the planning obviously being very important, but then how you do it so your germination rate is successful. And we'll show that in a minute here. But one thing, uh, all seeds do have an expiration date on the back of them, and in your opinion, I don't know who wants to answer this question, what do you experience in terms of if, if, it, if it says sell by uh, last year, do you still want to use those? Is, does it depend on the crop? Will they germinate? Uh, I would, I'm going to just speak up for a minute because I think you definitely can use them the next year unless that p package did not germinate for you the previous year. In other words, if you had bad luck, then don't use it. Because okay. sometimes you have a brand new package of seeds and your germinate, germination rate is not as good as expected. Okay. So if it doesn't work when you're supposed to use it. That's right. Or if it does work when you're yeah, supposed to use it, right. try it again try the it, next try year. Try it again the saying. next year. And, and we were talking, that it's probably good for four or five years. Okay. okay. So that's good to know, too, that you don't have to throw out your old seeds. Exactly. And yeah. you should still experience almost as good of a yeah. germination yeah. rate with most, yeah. most vegetables. Okay, great. Again, you're not spending, you know, you're not, it's not too much of a waste of money if they don't germinate though that's the cool thing about starting seeds you know it's a dollar 79 if they don't germinate it's a bummer but right you have them you know really you do a few it. extra yeah. and if you don't have yeah, a few you try you have again. enough yeah, yeah yeah 
All right, well, it's great to see all these seeds. Like I say, I get all excited at the beginning of the year when I see these kind of things come up in the garden center. And, and uh, you know, I'm one of the ones who, I, I don't start my seeds, so I'm anxious to learn more. Let's go over and take a look and show our, our viewers how we actually successfully start seeds. Let's come over this way. Okay, here we are with a nice workbench, perfect place to start some seeds and you can do this, I suppose people could do this in their in their garages, in their basements starting in mid-February. Yeah. And uh, Neil, we're going to ask you just to guide us through the process. I guess it all starts with the soil. The soil mix is a very important. Uh, you could do it different ways about it. You could buy bags like this all together for uh, People who first start out, that's probably the easiest solution is to is to buy a bag that pre-mix. Pre-mix, it's already done. You don't have to mix anything up. Uh, you put it in trays that you can purchase at any uh, nursery or Lowe's or Home Depot. Do you have your own secret that. soil ingredient mix? Uh, I can't tell anybody that secret yeah, I didn't think soil so. mix. I didn't yeah, think so. Give us a so over time, you develop. So, you, yes. you develop a, uh, a sense of yeah, what instance, soil works best. What we did here, we we did these this morning. Uh, we, we buy one of these things here to get started. You, what I do is I put like four or five different ingredients or different mixes we have on the floor. Potty mixes, uh, I like to use different ones because one doesn't have what the other one has. Do you change it for the type of vegetable that you're producing? Uh, like not, peppers, tomatoes, not really. Not, 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 not when I start things. It's pretty much as long as you have a good mix and a good ingredient. I always will add a couple handfuls in a mix like this. I will. I will put a couple uh, handfuls of cow manure in there. Just okay. To, just to give it a little kick. A little organic or a little right. nitrogen. Just a little nitrogen in there. But mostly you got, I can see the little perlite pieces in yeah, there. Yeah, perlite, there's a, a vermiculite, vermiculite. And, and stuff like that that's in there. Heavily and, peat and bark based. Right. I mean, I, and I, don't, I wouldn't stick with just a, uh, a Miracle Grow. Miracle Grow has a little more wood that it's okay, but you don't want too much of it. A, uh, you a want a lot of fines because the seed needs contact. That's right. On that's right. You want it fluffy, and you want you don't want to when you do these trays, you just do it naturally. You just basically do it with your hand okay. at, after the fill up. You don't squeeze them down. Everything is uh, has a lot of air in it right now. All these trays, and what we do after we fill them up, uh, after the mix is done. Before I forget, we do have to add water to this because you don't want to you don't want to do a mix that's dry and then put dry mix into the trays. It's hard to get it it's wet. It's hard actually. to get it wet. So you always make sure it make sure that soil is damp enough that you know it, you can they, squeeze they, it into a squeeze ball. into a ball and you know you can do, you can even do a little more than that if you want. Okay. Uh, because once once these are wet, which which we have here already, that's going to be probably good almost for like four or five days without watering it. They stay wet they when stay they start wet. out. Yeah, they stay out, uh, they stay wet during that time. Okay. So basically, I just take a pencil, very easy. You read the instructions on the, the seed package, which is like tomatoes or uh, peppers are pretty much the same. You only, it's a quarter of an inch. I just use a pencil, uh, half of that pencil. I just make a little, small little indentation like that. Don't go too deep. Okay, and then from there, Make sure you have identification tags, very important. You know, when you do all these and all of a sudden you forget which one is what, then you're in big trouble. <laughs> so you've okay. got it right here. These are Yeah, so jalapenos. what I like to do, I like to put the tag right right away so you'll know that you're not going to, you know, be confused. So basically, you just drop them in like this one at a time, right in the middle. When we do all, I'm not going to do all these right now on, on, on camera here, but that's basically what we do. Okay. And what I also will do, I won't cover them yet because I know which seeds are where. I'll always put a couple on the corners, always. A couple extras. In case yeah. you don't have germination. Yeah, or abs you absolutely. Yeah. You know, I'll always take a couple because you think everyone's going to come up, they're not going to come up. And the corners are very easy. You put that, that tool you have right there, you can easily get at it when it, when it comes up. So you put a couple on the corners. So pretty much after that's all done, you basically just lightly cover them and then that's it. You, uh, if, but you have to put these in a warm area. You can't down cellar sometimes unless you have a wood stove. Or so you don't even water it. You just cover them up for the first you said, yes, four or five days, four or five and then days. you get on the water. Yep, because they're already the soil's already wet, and you don't want to overwater it. Okay. And once it's wet, it's going to stay wet to like four or five days. Okay. Again, it's mid February. It might be the beginning of March. You're you're starting your seeds. Where do you then put this tray? What kind of light exposure does it need? Uh, there's different ways of doing it. You could have like a uh, window box. You could have a uh, like a bay window. You could 
heat source that's next to it. You could use blankets, those heated blankets underneath it, like a table. How many hours also. of light does it need, preferably? Oh, as, as far as germinate, you don't need really any light. You just need the heat. You just the heat. You don't need any light at all. When they that comes out. into play right. later on. Right. It's, it's heat. It, it's just the heat and make sure that that's, that soil stays warm. Okay. And the warmer it is, as long as it's not too warm, because when it's too warm, I'll show you later, that the seeds come up very fast and they, they get spindly. They get weak. They yeah. get weak. Yeah. So it could even be in the dark. It just has to be warm. It just has to be warm. Okay. And then typically, how many days till you start to see? Well, as soon as I as soon as I see it start to come up to a point, we'll move them right to a, a window or a, a great be it have a greenhouse like this, but we don't. Mm -hmm. Most most places don't. Uh, homeowners have like a small window, or you know maybe a, the best solution would be a sunroom would be great. A sunroom, uh, and you can buy these grow lights. The grow lights uh, That's setups. A few trays yes, on yep, and uh, they have those little uh, huts with plastic. You can you can purchase also right and, and that keeps it warm inside and you know pretty much a three season so 100 200 dollar maybe you can get something that could actually goes in your house for seed starting with yep. the lights ample heat and really all you need are a few trays for most average size vegetable gardens you don't need a lot of room no not, not your vegetable room. garden but the average one well i need a lot of room yeah, you need a lot of room Right. Well, yeah, Neil is making the point that when you grow, say, tomatoes, um, you've got a full tray here. You think about how much space that ends up being in uh, July. It's a lot of space. You really have to plan your garden because, like, one tray like this, 18 tomato plants, say, or 18 pepper plants. Yes. That'll take over a 10 by 10 uh, area of in the garden. garden. You know? Right. So, so you really have to plan, you know, and like I said, when you open a package of seeds, you don't have to use all these seeds. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Use enough for maybe one tray if you're going to do it yourself. That's a lot, believe me. You have to have a big garden if you're going to do that. Tomatoes, and then you go back to other things like onions or whatever else you're going to put in. You can garden. start just about anything from seed, right? Everything you can start from seed. The whole salad, yep. radishes, everything. carrots. And then you get into beans, broccoli, whatever you want. And a lot of stuff can be put in pots. Like uh, we were very successful with growing uh, onions from, from pots and lettuce from pots. Right, right. You get them on a the table, up off the ground. So, Melissa, talk to us about watering. Let's say this was in the pot for four or five days. How do you go about doing the watering? Uh, I think it's most important to watch your watering when you when bef before they've come up, actually, because um, in, in the way that I see it is a little bit different than Neil. I do these rows. Um, if and you, I were wait, to, let's talk about that. You do this because okay. you're mass producing, I, not for your own garden, but for the garden more. Yeah, I'm, I'm for, doing for it here for, for Western Nursery, so right. it's easier for me to do these rows. I do about 20 per row seeds right next to each other, and then I have to. I don't have to water as much. They're compact. They're in there. And once they develop a root system, that's when I uh, pull them up, pull them apart. They're nice and healthy, and I want to make sure that it is that way before I transplant. So. The watering at that point isn't really an issue. When the seeds first go in though, if I were to come up with a hose and just water, or even if I were at home and it was underneath the sink, um, it would be really easy to blow those seeds right out of, the, of their little cells. And so it's important to make sure that you just mist or buy the proper uh, watering container. And because see that, that that's a gentle, that's a gentle splash little effect. splash, yeah, that, and or even, even more on, gentle, uh, and more spirit. gentle on on the seed starting. I would do this, right. Neil. So right. I won't I won't smother your uh, <laughs> any little seeds. But it's really really important. I think uh, it's very frustrating when when you have that happen when you have them blow out. So okay, you go to the trouble of doing all this. Make sure that you um you know that you're watering correctly. So these are the emerging seeds. This could be four or five weeks down the road. We're looking at here. Yep. Yep. Depending is, on the crop. Depending on the seed. Yeah. These sweet peas and um and peas in general shoot up right away. And then what do you do to thin them out and transplant them? You put them into a, probably a three or four inch pot. Exactly, that's what I do, yep. And um, it's now really- Now would the homeowner do that as well or at this time should it be ready to, actually they don't grow in here, they're starting from here so they'll see it come this if big If they wanted year. to do it this way they could. There, I know people who are fanatical about peas say, or sweet peas, they do, they do a fair amount. They could, you could easily do um, a tray like this and do all sweet peas and yeah. put them out early because they're a cold crop. Um, it's exciting to start them early. If you have the space or, you know, enough window, enough, enough uh, sun, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you can do it that way. So talk to me about, and Neil, you, you and I talked about this earlier, when you do the transplant, um, you've got to be careful. Um, it, it can get thin on the stem. What's that called? Uh, dampening off 
basically is what that, that's called. I'm going to show you a prime example. Let's move this out of the way. I have a wood stove down in my house, and basically if it's too hot, seeds come up very fast. And to a point, when your plants get like this, you really have to do something quick, because that's just going to, they're going to die on you, pretty much. This is a prime example right here, dampening off right here. This is what happens. The lower part of the stem oh, yeah. rots out. And what is happens, that no good right now because that, I yeah, can see yeah, it's yeah, this is no good right now. But if I leave these just like they are, that's going to happen to pretty much all of those. Okay. Okay. So what I would do, I would take them right out, and I would, I would transplant them right away. You would just, you could take this right here. You could take anything. You just take, pull that thing up. It might break up on you, which, which is all right. You know, you take one plant like that. Right out, right out like that, and then you transplant it in one, one of those trays right here, and you bury that stem. Really bury it? Bury the stem, just have the leaves show. So this is interesting. I know when we talk about woody plants or perennials, we don't want to plant those too deep. No, but these guys can take it. The peppers and the tomatoes. Peppers, tomatoes are, are the ones that, that you can do this with. I think right, right, right up to the leaf. Right up to the leaves. You, you try not to cover the leaves. You, you, know, you don't want the leaves sitting in the dirt or the, or the, or the wet soil. Right. If you can, but very, very much like that. If you do all those, pull those right out. These are pretty tough plants. They're not really, you know, they can fall over on you. Now these are tomatoes, would you be able to do that type of transplanting with burying it deep with any type of vegetable or is it just certain it Just Just uh, peppers and tomatoes you, you'd want to bury them. Because they have the dampening off effect That's more right. than other things. That's right. Okay. But squashes, they're so fast and stuff like that. Cucumbers, they'll come up so fast and, and those are great for a different, a different setup. You know, different yeah, but pots. if you did that with say a basil plant, it would not make it, it wouldn't want to be buried like that. It's right, really well that's right, it's only, it's, just tomatoes they're really, it's just tomatoes and peppers. Really I've seen important. broccoli get that way though too, is there more like broccoli you might want to bury it a little deep? Uh, or am I not doing it right? You're probably not doing it right. <laughs> I think you might not be doing it right. Okay, thank you. <laughs> uh, the best part about being the host on the show is learning. <laughs> I guess you can talk to me more after. So you mentioned another way is, is called mounding. Mounding, yeah. We have another tray. Basically, when you fill these trays up, you could go a third less. Okay. Right? Put, put one in the middle like I did here. And when they come up, you basically add the soil. When it comes up to a so point... So instead of transplanting, just mound transplanting more soil. Instead of transplanting, you pull the soil right up around each plant quickly. And then that'll prevent it, you, know, you from having to go through all transplanting. Okay. And then it grows more and then you get to having to harden things off before you bring it outside, correct? That's correct. Uh, plants, to a point, you really don't want to bathe them too much. You want to protect them, you want to take care of them, but then when it comes to like, when they get to a point where like this size right here, mm -hmm. you would like to probably bring them outside for a couple hours. like like. So you're into March now, it's yeah, starting to yeah, get a day. But yeah, you say, say if, it's, if it's 40, these are very strong plants, they can withstand cold weather. So you can bring those outside for a couple, two or three hours. Now you don't yeah. want it to get, maybe not in the coldest night during that time of year. Right. It could get too cold no, still. I wouldn't leave them outside. I'm saying bring them outside for a couple hours, bring them in. And, okay. And then prolong that. You're just getting them used to the get, cold. Getting get, them so a little bit of work there, a little bit of labor. You, you back basically have to toughen them up is what it really. Before you permanently before you, put them out. Before you put them out. Because right now, if you just take those outside right now and put them outside, they're probably not going to do very well. Right, right. Okay, great. So that covers most of what you have to do to get it up to that size. Let's go look at some more finished vegetables that are actually look like what you'd purchase from a garden center and yeah. bring into your garden to see what a successful crop looks like. Let's right. go this way. All right, here's the finished product. Looks like you got a pepper, and Melissa, you got a tomato and a squash. We talked a lot about the seed starting with the peppers and the tomato, and this is a, approximately about an eight-week-old seed now. Eight, nine weeks, yep. Eight to nine weeks, yep. okay. And I see it's in one of these uh, compostable pots, which is great. You can rip this off. You can take the plastic off. You can put, the, put this directly in the ground. Okay, uh, now when you do plant it, tell us about how you would plant that in your garden. Peppers and tomatoes, you can't hesitate at all. When you put these in the ground, you can go at least up to that bottom leaf mm -hmm. right there, or even the higher. You can actually bury those. So you want to kind of straight, it tends to lean. Yeah, to but, but, but that's going to have more roots come out of this, this lower area right here. So it's just going to be root 
it strengthens. Roots come in, your strength is the, the, the plant, and pretty much that's going to spring back up. Okay, good. And the tomato Melissa's holding here, that yep. looks much more rigid. That's just the way it grows, but you still want to plant that a little deep. Yeah, yeah, yep. but th this guy actually, um, I have a few varieties here that are built to go into those hanging upside down. The, uh, oh, yeah, topsy turvies. The topsy turvies, they've, they've um, produced a, a tomato that's more bulky and bushy. It would also be fine for a smaller, uh, for like a deck or something. So that's oh, why yeah. this is as beefy as it looks. It's not as stringy as you might get if you were seeding a tomato at home. Right. Okay. As leggy. So okay. this is kind of ready to go in the ground right. now. Right, right. Um, but the same rule applies if it were uh, a, a longer, skinnier one. You could go further down, right, Neil? Definitely. Right. So you've grown this, talk economics for a second. You've grown this for pennies. And if you were to purchase this from your local garden center, it's a couple, no, it's more like four bucks, right? Four, four or five, five bucks, bucks. Yeah. yeah. So you can see the, uh, uh, the cost savings uh, right here. When you see that plant, it probably costs you under a buck when you did it yourself. A lot of work, the hardening well, off we talked about and all that. The labor, but yes, definitely. You yeah. But where you really save money. money, though, is in the, uh, when, when you think about buying tomatoes, you go to the store and how much they are a pound now. That's right. You're going to get a lot of tomatoes out right. of one Right, it's plant. the harvest. It's the harvest that you're and making. And enjoyment. And, and this is, fun. if you grew in your trays, this down here would be what, what things would look like if you, if you did everything great, maybe in your second year after you made your mistakes, second, right? Second, third year, yeah, realistic. Uh, it's good, though. <laughs> it's a lot of fun, uh, fun to be able to grow your own plants like that. You're holding something in your arm we should talk about. Oh, yeah, I didn't want to forget that um, how important it is to go from this Oops. to your garden. Um, right. You really should take notes. I always tell myself I'm going to take notes. It doesn't matter if it's in a gardens organizer or in a plain old little notebook. You really should take notes. On you want to know when, what you, you planted, know what you the, did name last year, the, variety, the name of it, what was successful, what wasn't. And you think you're going to remember, but you don't. You really should write it down. Right. It's so really nice to be able to refer back to what you did right. wrong and what you did right. And not only that, but labeling the row within the garden. Exactly. Label, 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 and... Uh, write everything down. And just to show the viewers, we do have a lot of other plants. It's really exciting. I mean, you can do just anything from seed. Here's got some dill. There's some dill and looks like some basil. Yeah. So all your herbs. Some chunky oregano over here. That's chunky, all right. Yeah. All right, that's great. I'm getting ready and excited. I just wish the snow would go away for <laughs> spring. And uh, thanks for teaching me and, and, and the viewers so much. We're going to go see Ann Well in the Did You Know segment, and she's going to, she's going to surprise us with a few topics today. Let's go see Ann. Hi. I know that you just heard about uh, starting seeds indoors, and that gives that whole illusion that the only thing to think about during this time of year is... Uh, the activities that you can do in terms of gardening that are indoors, but there are a couple of things that you should be on the lookout outdoors. One of those is hemlock woolly adelgid. Just like the name says, it affects hemlocks. It is woolly. Adelgid means that it's a sucking insect, and it is active, unlike most insects, actually during the coldest weather of the year. Actively feeding from mid-October till about mid-July. This is when it does the most damage. The adults uh, are actually going to be laying brand new egg clusters starting in March, and those are incredibly distinctive. So what you want to look for, I have a little sketch here. I do really disastrous sketches for customers, but they get a kick out of them. What you want to look for is on the underside of a hemlock branch, right at the base of the needles, each needle along the twig, are little cottony balls, and they line up either side of the stem, right down it. They're about an eighth of an inch, and they look like little balls of cotton. Very distinctive, you cannot miss it. Look for it in March. So this kind of damage, this feeding damage where they suck the sap out of the tree can actually kill a hemlock if you're not careful about it. But the good news is that it's very well controlled with fairly simple steps. If you want to go the most benign route, you're going to be looking at using horticultural oil. Horticultural oils come in various forms, various weights, and they work essentially by smothering. Very effective for HWA because it can smother the overwintering eggs, the nymphs, and the adults. Great product. So you're talking about doing it in time with the life cycle. That means that late winter, early spring, so you're talking late March, beginning of April, you're going to target those brand new egg masses with a dormant oil. That's the heavier weight oil. 
and you get good coverage over the tree and it will smother all of those eggs, knock down the population tremendously. This insect goes essentially dormant from during the hot weather months of the year, so mid-July until mid-October, and it's at the end of the summer that you actually follow up with another treatment. This time you'd be using an all-seasons oil, lighter weight, same idea at smothers, but now you're hitting adults, active nymphs, um, any eggs that may be left, uh, so you're trying to do another second big knockdown. On a heavily infested tree, you may find that sometimes they treat with a pyrethroid mixed in with that, which is a basic, not terribly horrible insecticide and a very effective, effective one. Key to control of HWA is to be thorough in the spray. If you've got a big hemlock that's involved, then you really need to get a professional in to help you do the spraying so that you can get good coverage. They can also inject imidacloprid, or you can do a drench. This is another whole route going through with the with the insecticide of sediment oil. Um, maybe not as effective for a heavily infested and uh, a tree that's been involved for a long time, but that's also a possibility. And if you want to go the soil injection route, you do need a professional to do. Um, sorry, a tree injection route, you do need a professional to handle that for you. So, be on the lookout for those little cottony masses, rows, right down the underside of the stems. Make sure that you're thorough in whatever approach you use, follow package directions always, and get a professional if you've got a really big tree so that you be safe and so that you get a better outcome. More information, go to umassgreeninfo.org. Thanks. <music>